class, tonight's paragraph is not easy. Uh, it's a beautiful paragraph. Don't misunderstand me. I believe it in every sense of the word. Uh, but still, it's got some tough places in it. Let me read it to you. 1 John chapter 4, verse 17, 18, and 19. Herein is our love made perfect. John wants to talk about love that has been perfected. Herein, I'll explain that. Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as He is, as Jesus is, so are we in this world. That is a bold statement. There is no, John continues in verse 18, there is no fear in love. Perfect love casteth out fear because fear has torment. And then verse 19. Well, I didn't finish 18. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him. Now 19. We love him because he first loved us. It is clear that the text in its entirety is about love, the love of God. It is equally clear because the word occurs two times in the three verse span, the word perfect. I'd go so far as to say perfect is the key word of our paragraph. And it is the word T-E-L-O-S, telos is the root. It is the word that means love that is grown up. Love that is mature. Love that has arrived at God's ideal plan and place for it. All I know to do is to take these verses, listen to me, line upon line, Precept upon precept. In Isaiah 28, that's how Isaiah preached. And see what the Holy Ghost gives us from these precious truths. Herein is our love made perfect. And he does say, our love. Herein is our love. My love, your love. And other class members love. And of course, that love God gave us, God poured out His love in us when we got saved. Herein is our love made perfect. That is Bible proof right there that some of us Christians have, uh, how am I going to say it? Baby love. Some of us Christians have mid-grade love, and there are even some Christians who have perfect love, grown-up love, mature love. Wow. And John says, herein is our love made perfect. Let me talk to you about that. How can I help? How can I cause my love to grow and become perfect. Remember, perfect does not mean sinless. Perfect does not mean without flaw. Perfect here means, I've already said it twice, mature. Mature, where God would have it be in somebody that's growing and has been growing in His love. I'm having this thought. Peter said, grow in grace. If grace can grow in my Christian life, Love can grow in my Christian life. In fact, Peter said, uh, grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. If my grace can grow, if my knowledge can grow, all I'm saying, my love can grow also. 
I can become better and better at practicing and exercising the love of God as the months go by. Give me some tools, preacher, that will help my love to be perfected, that will help my love to become mature. Here's tool number one. I hold it in my hand often. The Word of God. The Word of God. This will define God's love. This will qualify God's love and quantify God's love and explain God's love and show us God's love in action again and again and again. In fact, it does. The greatest single example of God's love in all of history is the cross of Calvary where Jesus died for us sinners. And where did I learn about it? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Isaiah 53, Psalm 22, the epistles of Paul as he gives us the great doctrines of Christology and soteriology, Jesus, and salvation. No, oh, oh, oh. Our love can grow, become perfect by the Word of God. Number two, our love can grow and become perfected, become mature by the working of the Holy Spirit in my life. We've all agreed a dozen times. The moment we get saved, God puts the Holy Ghost living, abiding in our hearts. Paul said our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. He abides, He dwells in me. And, and, uh, and then if the Holy Spirit's in there, oh, this marvelous list of things Paul gives us in Galatians 5. The fruit of the Spirit. And he gives nine qualities of the fruit of the Spirit. You know what number one is? Love. The fruit of the Spirit is love. He goes on to mention joy and peace and others. But up front, there is love. The Word of God will help my love to mature. The Holy Ghost will help my love to mature. I'll tell you something else that will help your love mature. Being in God's house, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together and interacting with your brothers and your sisters in Christ. Uh, there is a verse, Solomon wrote it in Proverbs, Iron sharpeneth iron. I love you with Jesus' love. You love me with Jesus' love. If we hit a bump, bumpy spot, a rough spot, we'll get it down. We'll not fuss and fight. I'll love you more than you'll love me more. Time, it's over. The Word of God, the Holy Ghost, my brothers and sisters. Herein, herein is our love made perfect. But what John is actually doing in this 17th verse, he is going to show us the result and I think one of the greatest benefits of our love being made perfect. Here it is, verse 17. That, that is called a Hena clause. We've gone over that before. It introduces a statement of purpose. Here's why God wants my love to mature, my love to develop and grow and advance that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. I say, that's, that's a tough line right there. That we Christians, that's who he's writing, may have boldness in the day of judgment. Now, Brother Bagel, I, I don't know about that. You know, the Bible says uh, that there's no condemnation for us that we're in Christ's head. Not judgment. Like, depart from me, you're going to hell. No, no, no. The judgment seat of Christ. It is no secret. Paul wrote it twice. We're all, all of us are safe. We're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Did you know one of these days after the rapture, one of these days as I stand before His presence, I'm going to have to give an account for, here's the King James Version, the words of Paul, for the deeds done in my body. Class, I really believe this. I'll have to give an account to God for why I taught this Bible class 
this summer afternoon. I'll have to give an account to God for my motives and my attitudes where I preached last night. Pine Fork Baptist Church, two and three quarters hour across the North Georgia mountains. I'll have to give an account to the Lord. John says, if your love is mature, if your love has been made perfect, you'll have boldness on the day of judgment. You'll not be fearful on the day of judgment. And that word boldness, we've had it before. Parasia. Parasia. What does it mean? To say everything. To tell Jesus all that's on your heart. Should Jesus ask me, Mike Bagwell, why did you spend years and years and years in evangelism preaching the word of God and revival? I would be able to say it all. Jesus, you know my heart. And you know that the best of my knowledge, I'm telling you the truth, I did it because you saved me. I did it because you called me. I did it because really I enjoyed doing it. I did it for your glory. I did it for so that brothers and sisters would grow in the Lord. I did it to encourage every pastor in every church. I'll be able to speak boldly at the day of judgment. You can't speak boldly if you don't have assurance in your heart that God loves you. You know who the judge is going to be at the judgment seat of Christ? I can answer that. Jesus. John in his gospel tells us that God the Father hath committed all judgment to his Son. I believe that's the great white throne judgment. I believe that's the judgment seat of Christ. I believe that includes the judgment of the nations. All judgment to the Son. And when I stand at the judgment seat of Christ and have to give an account for everything I've done as a Christian, and, and by the way, the, the evaluation when He judges me, everything I've done will fall into one of two categories. Wood, hay, and stubble or gold, silver, and precious stone. That's what Paul taught us. I'll be able to tell him what I've done. Parasia. Boldly. Telling him everything. Why? Listen to me. Because I know he's not out to get me. Because I know this is not a judgment of punishment. Because I know the issue here is not whether I'm going to heaven or hell. He's already saved me. I, the judgment seat of Christ is for believers only. Because I know the love of God for me. Because I know the love of Jesus for me. Because maybe I have matured a little bit in that love. I'll have boldness in the day of judgment. I really believe that's what it means. There's more. Because as He is, as Jesus is, so are we in this world. As Jesus is, so are we in this world. Oh, we've got to talk about that. That is one bold statement there. As Jesus is, so are we in this world. Let me try to explain it. Here's an attempt to explain what is obviously a difficult, a difficult clause of Scripture. As He is, so are we in this world. Anybody believe He's the Son of God? I hope I'm hearing some amens. Anybody believe He's the Son of God? As He is, so are we in this world. I, I hope, I, I'll say hallelujah on this one. I am a Son of God. Hallelujah. As He is, so are we in this world. He is the Son of God. I am a Son of God. He is the sinless Son of God. I am an ex-sinner saved by grace and adopted into the family, but I'm still a Son of God. As He is, so are we in this world. Let me tell you what He is. He is victor over the devil. He said, I have come to destroy the works of the devil. And I believe, he, I, believe the, I believe the major battle was won at Calvary. The mopping up will occur at the uh, Battle of Armageddon when the Lord comes back and deals with the Antichrist and that whole wicked crowd. He is victor over the devil as he is. So am I in this world. I can overcome the devil through the blood of Jesus. I can overcome the devil 
as Jesus did. It is written, it is written, it is written with the Word of God. I can overcome the devil because greater is he that is in me, Jesus, than he that is in the world. As he is, so are we in the world. Let me tell you something else Jesus is. Oh, this is helping my love. If, if Jesus has already given me all these things that he is, and I can participate in them right now, oh my, I'm growing in God's love for me. I'm growing in understanding how Jesus loves me. Jesus is, will I get an amen? Sitting at the Father's right hand right now. Right now, he's already seated in heaven. And Paul, in Ephesians chapter 2, says we Christians are already seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus our Lord. In God's eyes, it's not a matter of whether I'm going to go to heaven. In God's eyes, I'm already there. I'm already seated. The victory has already been. As He is, so are we in this world. If God loved me that much to impart to me the same Holy Ghost that helped Jesus live sinlessly, that raised Jesus from the grave, the same Holy Ghost that gave Jesus victory and all, and God has given me as He is, so am I in this world. I don't have any fear. I'll be able at the judgment seat. I'll be able when I face the day of judgment for us believers. I'll be able to tell Him. I'll be able to converse with Him. I'll be able to talk with Him without any fear. Here is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as Jesus is, so are we in this world. Verse 18, there is no fear in love. There is no fear in love. I heard my daddy say again and again growing up, he said, Oil and water will not mix. He would apply it to different life situations. Oil and water will not mix. Listen to me. God's love and fear will not mix. If you've got a healthy appreciation and possession of the love of God for you, you will have no fear of God. This word fear is phobos. P-H-O-B-O-S. Class, listen to me. I, I need to uh, give a little bit of a detailed explanation. In the New Testament, using this very word, phobos, there can be a good kind of fear and a bad kind of fear. Here is phobos in a good sense. The fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord. Dozens and dozens of times in our Old Testament, and again, not as frequently, but in the New, fear God. The fear of the Lord. That's a good fear. It means reverence, honor, respect, worship. That kind of fear, get all of it you can. The fear of the Lord is to depart from evil. The fear of the Lord, God says, if you fear me, I'll give you honor. I'll give you, I'll give you success. I, I even said one day, I'll give you long life. I'll give you, oh my, phobos in a good sense. But John is using it here in a bad sense. John's phobos is fear that makes me worry. Fear that makes me fret. Fear that paralyzes me. Fear that has me walking the floor, biting my fingernails. Am I saved or not? Am I in God's good graces or not? Does God love me or not? I did something that might not please Him. Maybe He doesn't love me anymore. That's the detrimental fear about which John is speaking. I better read verse 18 again. There is no fear in love. If I baptize myself, if I get saturated in the love of God, how God loves me. And I'll learn it in that book right there. That love will eliminate dread, panic, 
paralyzing fear in my Christian life. Verse 18 continues. There is no fear in love, but perfect love. That's that grown-up love. Mature love casteth out fear. Casteth out there. It is the verb balo. B-A-L-L-O. It means it throws it out. It ejects it. This is not meaning that my love is perfect, that I never make a mistake. It, it's not our love in that sense. It's our love in the sense of appropriating how much He loves me. Realizing to what extent Jesus went to express His love for me. He went to the extent of dying on the cross. Perfect love casteth out fear. If I've got a good grip on how much God loves me, fear will have to go. Fear of judgment. Fear of the judgment seat of Christ. Fear of having to answer for the deeds done in my perfect love casteth out fear. Listen to this. Because fear has torment. Fear has torment. Oh my, what a word. Using torment as a possibility in the lives of Christian believers. I really believe there's some folks who are saved. I don't have any doubt there, but that they're going to heaven and they live every day in torment. They live every day worrying, fretting, doubting. They live every day. They live every day in uncertainty. God is not the author of that. And God, let me tell you what God just said. If you ever, if it ever dawns on you how much I love you, all that fear, all that dread, all that panic will vanish. Perfect love casteth out fear because fear hath torment. Only two places in the New Testament is this word torment used. Jesus used it in his uh, Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24 and 25, where he says, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And he sentences the wicked, the lost, to everlasting torment. I think one thing John is saying here, if I know the love of God, the depth of it, the breadth of it, the height of it, the, oh my, the length, if I know how much He loves me, if I know even a fraction of how much Jesus loves me, it'll be gone. I'll have no fear of torment. I'll have no fear that I'll ever die and go to hell. I'll have no fear that should my life perish in some tragedy tomorrow, no doubt where I'll go. I won't go. I have no, no, not a place of torment. There's no torment. God loves me. God died for me. God saved me. God indwells me. God keeps me secure. God's promise absent from the body when I die present with the Lord. I'll not have that torment. And then the verse is also saying, if I keep it in context, you don't have to dread the judgment seat of Christ. Oh, you may hear some rather stiff things. Why were you lazy those three years? You have no works to show here for the... We may hear something like that. I, I, I don't know exactly. But I'll have no fear. I'll have no dread. Because those words will come from somebody that loves me. Here's why. I think, here's why. John is saying we'll have no fear when we stand before Christ in the day of judgment. And again, the judgment seat of Christ. Here's why. Please smile with me. I know the judge. I know the judge. The judge is my Savior. The judge is the one who loved me enough to die for me. The judge is the one, I could say this and prove it biblically, he's my older brother. Jesus is the firstborn among us brethren. That's exactly what Paul called him in Hebrews. Jesus is, I know Him. He's never had an ill thought toward me. Nothing can keep Him from loving me. 
Nothing can, nothing can uh, uh, rob me of his security and love extended my way. Wow. Wow. No wonder. Perfect love casteth out fear. He that feareth, the end of verse 18, he that feareth is not made perfect in love. Class, I want you to listen to me. If you're living week after week and month after month of your Christian experience in fear, I don't know what other word, in worry, biting your fingernails, not able to sleep at night, I wonder if I'm saved or not. Uh, I, I wonder if I'm in God's good grace or not. I wonder if He'll reward me at the judgment. Uh, I, I, I wonder, did I fail Him? Did I fail Him? Did I do wrong? If you, let me read it again. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. I'm not saying you're lost if you fret and fear, worry and gnaw your fingernails, pace the floor. If you've got no lasting faith, I'm not saying you're lost. I believe you could be washed in the blood and going straight to heaven when you die. I am saying this. Your idea of God's love is not mature. Your concept of how much Jesus loved you, it just hadn't hit you yet. Just hadn't dawned on you yet. Because if you're fearing, your life is not yet made perfect. Not yet matured in His love. This ought to challenge someone. Extra credit, students. This ought to challenge someone tonight as soon as class is over or if you watch it in the mornings, as soon as class is over, get out your Bible. Get you out some commentary, some help book, a concordance, your computer software, and study every verse on the love of God you can. And you'll find out His glove is unconditional. You'll find out as a Christian there's nothing you can do to, that would rob you of His love if you ever, ever really comprehend, halfway comprehend how much He loves you, the fretfulness and the fear will be gone. Then verse 19, we love Him because He first loved us. I think John put that beautiful verse in place there. One of the best known verses in our chapter in 1 John 4. I think he put it there to say, hey y'all, this thing has not been about your love because your love eventually, because we're humans, because we're sinners saved by your love, will get weak and discouraged and will fail sometimes. Not about us loving Him. It's about Him loving us first. If my report at the judgment seat of Christ is based on my love for my brethren, I might be in trouble. I might ought to get to bite my own fingernails. If my report, if my response, if the deed's done in my body that Jesus will examine at the judgment seat, if it's based on His love, His love, if I'm comprehending how what He did to get me saved, I got no fears. I got no worry. I've got no frets whatsoever. We love Him, and I'm glad we do. We love Him. That's a present tense verb. Loved Him today. Plan on loving Him tomorrow. I'm going to go on and on and on and on loving Him till He calls me to glory. We love Him because they call it a because clause. Here is why we love Him. He set the ball in motion. He started the cycle because He first loved us. And that is an aorist tense verb. It means in the past. He loved me in a point of time. When I was born. Before I was born. He loved me. At the cross of Calvary when Jesus died. He loved me. He loved me before I got saved. He loved while we were yet sinners. He died for me. He, he, lo he has loved me with an indescri ineffable, indescribable love. And if I can ever get a grip 
I'm that kind of love. Oh, well, I'll love him. I'll never doubt him. That love will cast out fear. And I know good and well at the day of judgment, I'll not be quivering in my boots. I'll be smiling. And I can tell him everything. Anything. All things that I've tried to do for his honor, his glory, and his sake. Herein is our love made perfect. God perfect our love through the Word, through the Holy Ghost, through our church services, through fellowship. Well, God, I'm praying for every member of our class. Help our love to grow and mature. Teach us more and more about the depth of your love for us and what Jesus did for us, illustrating that love. In Jesus' name, amen. Hereby is our love made perfect that we can have boldness the judgment seat of Christ. That we can have boldness in the day of judgment. Hey Jesus, I love you. You're my friend. Best friend. You never failed me. No. Oh, you want to know about that revival? Oh, Lord, I'll tell you, I did the best I could. If I failed you, uh, you're going you're gonna to examine it. But, but Lord, I, I, I'll be able to talk to him openly and fully, telling it all. Because as he is, so are we. In this world. He has empowered me. He has prayed for me. He has encouraged me. He has upheld me because as He is, so are we in this world. There's no fear in love. If you've got that kind of love, that kind of God love in you, there's no fear. Real perfect love will kick that fear out of town. It's gone because that kind of fear has torment. They ought to have torment to the lost. They're going to hell. Should have no torment to us, say people. We can't go to hell. Impossible for us to go to hell. I told somebody the other day, and if you don't agree with me, I love you and all. I told somebody the other day, I said, This is a hell proof preacher. What? This is a hell proof preacher. I've been washed in the blood of the Lamb and in the confidence of that love, and the confidence of that love. I have no thoughts of torment. He that fears and worries, I thank God's helping me get over that, is not made perfect in love. You'll not fear if you ever mature and grow in the love of God. And then I love Him. Hallelujah. And I'm enjoying doing it. I love Him. But it's because He started it. He's the initiator. He first. He first love to me mm. I want to give a little quote to you I think it'll help somebody uh, I need not fear anything in my past I need not fear anything in my present and I'm going to go ahead and say it and I need not fear anything in my future Preacher, I just don't understand what you mean by that. My past is under the blood. Could I get an amen there? Come to think of it, my future is under the blood too. My present. If I made a mistake today, I didn't do it willingly. I didn't do it knowingly. I didn't do it in utter sheer rebellion. I did it by mistake, inadvertently, accident, and God knows that and He loves me, and He, Lord, I confess it, I, He'll forgive me of that sin and cleanse me. I need not fear my past, my present, nor my future, because I'm the subject of, I'm enveloped, I'm wrapped up in God's great love for me. I came across this little quote. I'd like to share it with you. I'm going to paraphrase it. Some Christians... All they're concerned about and all they'll preach about is holiness. It's okay. Well, I like the idea of holiness. Living for God. Keeping short. Set. Some Christians, all you'll hear in their services is witnessing. Soul winning. I'm in agreement. I believe in witnessing. I believe in soul winning. The lost are going to... You go to other places, all you'll hear is separation from sin. Don't do this. Don't do that. Stay away, come out from among them. And I agree, we're to stay away from sin. We're to be. 
But the solution to all of it, holiness, soul winning, witnessing, separation from sin, the solution to all of it is getting wrapped up, enveloped, encompassed with the love that God has for me. And if it'll ever hit me, how much He loved me, how much He did for me, I'll be holy. I'll tell people about Jesus. I will abstain from the very appearance of evil. Mm. I know the judge, and he'll never do anything. I know his love for me. He'll never hurt me. He'll never detrimentally bring harm to my life. Hallelujah. I want to read you a verse. In fact, it's several verses. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? The devil dedicates himself to convincing us that something can part us from the love of Jesus. What in the world can separate us from the love of Christ? That verb separate means to put, can you see my fingers? To put any space between. See, there's space between my hands, and now there is no space. Separate any space between. Nothing can put even an inch, even a half an inch, even a millimeter of space between me and my Savior, between me and the love of God. Listen, who shall separate us, pull us apart, from the love of Christ? Tribulation? Distress? Persecution? Famine? If it gets so bad, nakedness? Peril? The sword? Paul said, I'm persuaded. And the Holy Ghost gave him this faith. I'm persuaded. Death can't separate me from the love of God. My death will just drive me further into the love of God. And uh, life? Angels? Including the demons of hell? They can't separate me from the love of God. Angels, principalities, powers, anything present, I have no fear of the present. Anything to come, I have no fear of the future. Nor height, nor depth, nor breadth, nor any other creature. Just in case Paul left something, any other creature will be able to pry you apart from the God's love for you, from Jesus' love for you, Christ's love. For you. If we ever realize that kind of love for us, we'll have no fear. We'll have boldness to talk to Him any, any time. Wow. I read this. I'm going to have to watch my time. I'm going to have to close. I, I wrote it down. I, I, I think I'd like to share it with you. The preacher said, it's not original with me. The preacher said, God's love is cross-shaped. I want to repeat that. God's love is cross-shaped. If you want to see God's love in action, go to that old rugged tree, Golgotha's hill. All those years ago, God's love is cross-shaped. Shaped. If you know God's love, if you are abiding in the love of God, and the best I know I am, though I've got a hundred miles of growing to do in that love, I have no fear. I have no torment. No apprehension about hell. And even when I stand before His judgment, I do not fear. The judge is my Lord. The judge is my Savior. Father, honor this class especially in our class members' hearts to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Join next class. We'll just keep studying. Probably finish 1 John 4, but my, my, 1 John 5 awaits, verse by verse, studying the Word of God. Some of you have been mighty faithful. I appreciate it. Some of you don't ever comment, but I know you're out there. You'll tell me in a river. Let's keep studying the Word of God.